Hey guys, so in this lecture we are going to be looking at seed management. And there are four big topics that we are going to cover. We're going to start by looking at measures of germination. Then we're going to look at methods to improve germination, and that's when our seeds are no longer dormant, if they have a dormancy condition. Uh, we'll then talk about methods to break seed dormancy, right? And there's two big methods, scarification and stratification. And then we will talk about growing plants for seed as opposed to growing them for fruit. So, measures of germination. There are three big ways that we can measure germination. And the first that we're going to look at is germination percentage. Now, sometimes you will see this referred to as germination rate, but germination rate can also refer to germination speed that we're going to look at later. So if you see that term, it's important to uh, see exactly what it's referring to, right? There's a little bit of ambiguity sometimes with that term. But if we're talking, talking about germination percentage, really what we're looking at is the number of seeds uh, that produce a seedling from a seed population, right? So if you have, as the example there, if I have 100 seeds, it's out of that 100 seeds, how many are germinating to produce seedlings, right? So, and it's a simple percentage. So if I had that 175 seeds germinate, then I would have a germination percentage of 75%, right? 75 divided by 100. If it was, uh, I had 50 seeds and 25 germinated, then I would do the same thing. I would take 25 divided by 50, and that would give, and then multiply by 100, and that would give me a 50% germination uh, percentage. All right, so just the proportion of seeds that germinate. We can also measure germination and look at the speed of germination. And again, sometimes it's referred to as rate. And this is going to measure how rapidly a seed lot germinates, right? So instead of uh, when we're looking at percentage, it's how many. Now we're looking at how fast they germinate. And typically, we uh, set a time for it to reach a certain germination percentage. Right, so for example, and we'll write that as T and the number. So for the example, if we are interested in T50 or the time it takes for 50% of our seed lot to germinate, we would measure how many seeds are germinating each day or by hour as you have in this graph down here. And then we can determine how long it took to get the 50% germination. So for here in this hypothetical example here, we had a couple different treatments that they looked at and they plotted it by a graph, and the time to get to T50 would be, if we look at a germination percentage at 50 right here, the time it took for each treatment, you would go across, and you would see how long it took, right? So in this case, for this one, it would be about, you know, it looks about like 50 hours or so, right? And so you can graph this data. You could uh, just have a table that shows you uh, how long it took for each seed lot or by day or by hour how many seeds uh, germinated and eventually you could determine your germination speed. And the last measure of germination that we're going to look at is uniformity, right? So we looked at percentage, so how many are germinating. We are looking at how fast they are germinating. And then uniformity is a measure of spread. So how close together is this seed lot, are these seeds germinating, right? And typically, as an easy way to measure this, we will take the spread between an early percentile and a late percentile. For example, we could look at the spread between the time it took to get to 75% germination versus the time it took to get to 25% germination. And we could subtract 25, that time of T25 from T75, and that would give us a measure of uniformity. And the idea is that the smaller the spread, so that smaller that number, the more uniform the germination would be. So that's one way of doing it. It's an easy way to do it. There are other measurements. You could take um, the average or the mean and standard deviation, et cetera. But this simple uh, time between percentiles is kind of a nice, easy uh, way of measuring uniformity. And we could just see this again. We could see this graphed here where... If you have a closer spread, as you see in our primed seeds, and we'll talk about what prime seeds means in a bit, that would be a more uniform germination as opposed to your untreated seeds there. 
So three measures of germination, they each tell us a little bit of, a little bit different. Uh, they give us a little bit different information about our seeds, uh, but they can use them all together to kind of uh, assess how well your seeds are germinating, right? From different standpoints, whether they you have good germination percentage, whether they are all germinating uniform, uniformly, and how fast they're germinating. And that leads us into this idea of seed vigor, which is properties of a seed that determine the potential for uniform emergence and the development of normal seedlings under a wide range of field conditions, right? So if we talk about seed vigor, it's just these properties that these seeds may have that will allow them to have good germination under a wide range of field conditions. And we measure that germination looking at those things that I just mentioned, right? Percentage, speed, and uniformity. So that's how we kind of can assess germination of our seeds. Now let's kind of take, uh, let's take some time and look at ways that we can improve germination. So I mentioned seed priming in uh, that two slides ago when we looked at uniformity. And what seed priming is, it is a form of controlled seed hydration that can improve seed vigor, really germination speed and uniformity. And it can also help seeds germinate under adverse conditions, whether it's cold, wet, hot conditions that otherwise wouldn't, wouldn't be preferential for these seeds to germinate. So really what you're doing is you hydrate your seeds, like you, you soak them and buy, they imbibe water, right? And they get through this first phase and then they begin this second phase. So remember our first phase of germination, imbibition, our seed takes in water, and that kicks off all these metabolic processes that start happening during the second phase, right? And then we refer to this lag phase, right? DNA starts being repaired, it starts making proteins, etc. And right when we get to this stage here, there it is, we get to that lag phase, we then dry our seed out again, and it dries back to its original water content. Uh, and now, Later on, when we go to plant these seeds and germinate them, they have a kickstart of this process, right? So they got to about here, and we dry them back again. And then now, when we restart this process, they already have had some of this uh, metabolic processes occur during this germination, and they should germinate faster and more uniformly uh, when they are primed, right? And you see an example here with some of this data where with our prime seeds are germinated, it's a much uh, lower spread than with our unprimed. It's more spread out. So how does this actually work? And it's different from pre-soaking seeds. We'll talk about pre-soaking seeds a little bit later. That's done more to alleviate uh, dormancy conditions, particularly when there's a physical dormancy, like a hard seed coat. So seed priming is primarily done uh, commercially. I don't know of people who are priming seeds themselves necessarily. I think when people do it, they're talking more about soaking their seeds. Uh, and there's four methods of seed priming. There's hydro priming, where you are soaking seeds in water, but again, there is a more complicated process to it. There are osmotic priming, where you're soaking seeds in a solution that contains either sugars or salts, you could do solid matrix priming, where you're soaking seeds in some sort of matrix such as vermiculite. We'll talk about vermiculite a little bit later in another lecture. Or you could do drum priming, which there's an example of a priming drum there, uh, where your seeds are rotated, and as they're rotated, they're sprayed with water vapor uh, to do this priming process. And then the important process is after they are hydrated, they're then dried out again. And like I said, you are doing this, um, this is being done uh, commercially. It's not, you know, like your average home grower is not priming their own seeds. What they're doing is they're buying already primed seeds, right? And this comes in handy for high value seeds where uniform germination is required. Typically, when we are talking about our bedding plants. So our bedding plants are a lot of times flowers that we are growing to uh, go into flower beds, right? Add uh, color to flower beds, uh, whether it is, you know, at a home or a business, etc. Wherever people are planting, wherever people have landscaping beds, flower beds, we're growing bedding plants for that purpose. So if you are a greenhouse and you get an order where you need to produce 100 flats 
of some particular bedding plant. And maybe this bedding plant is uh, difficult to grow or is a little more um, temperamental in germination, right? It may be hard to germinate. Maybe it doesn't have great germination uniformity. It might be better for you to purchase primed seeds with the knowledge that those seeds are going to germinate more uniformly, they're going to germinate faster, so you're more likely to be able to satisfy that order in the appropriate amount of time, right? If you have, you know, a month and a half to grow begonias, uh, which could be difficult to germinate uniformly, and you need to germinate a whole bunch of them, it might make sense for you to buy prime seed to ensure that you're going to be able to meet that order. And there are a number of uh, places where you can find prime seed. I just have an example right here where they sell to both commercial greenhouses and they even sell to, you know, uh, regular people just looking, home growers. But you can buy prime seed if you would like. The downside to prime seeds is that because of this process, you know, there's an extra cost associated, so they're a little more costly, and those seeds don't store as well, right? You're not going to be able to store your prime seeds long-term as you would a non-primed seed. All right, so that's one way that we could one method we could use to improve germination. Uh, another example of things that people do to improve germination is pelleting. And this is more so um, for ease of use for the practitioner, right? So uh, small seeds, what, what pelleting is, is you take small or regularly shaped seeds and we coat them in this inert clay-like substance to make them round and uniform. Right? And it's really uh, to make it easier for us to manipulate these seeds. Right? So if um, they're all round, they're all uniform, we can use mechanical seeders. Again, this is if we are at a large scale operation, uh, even for just ease of use for yourself. It's a little bit easier if you are planting carrot seeds, lettuce, again, begonias I talked about. Uh, really, all these very small seeds, if they're pelleted, it makes it a lot easier for you to handle those seeds, for you to use a mechanical seeder, um, easier to space your pellets, uh, your pelleted seed out. Uh, so this is more for ease of use for the practitioner rather than something inherent that is going to improve germination, but it's something that I just wanted you guys to be aware of. And there is, again, you can buy pelleted seed. But there is a, um, a protocol for actually doing it yourself, if anyone was interested. Uh, and there's the link right there. I believe it is some university that developed it and they put it online. So typically, um, pelleting was like a trade secret for different companies, right? They had their own formula or own method of doing it. And then some scientists just kind of figured out a methodology for doing it yourself and just shared it with the world. Uh, so again, I don't know if anyone's going to go uh, try pelleting your own seeds, but if you are interested, there is the PDF for you guys down there, or at least the link that will lead you to it. So another way to improve germination is bottom heat. And again, so when we talked about in our last lecture, when we looked at germination, one of the big factors... Uh, environmental factors that uh, you need or influences germination is temperature, right? So we need uh, a certain temperature for our plants, for our seeds to germinate. And we said that while there is a range of temperatures that our seeds can germinate in, there is often an optimal temperature, right? Where they are going to germinate the best at. They'll have the best uh, germination percentage. They'll germinate the fastest, more, the most uniform at that optimum. Well, many times, uh, for a lot of our crop species, that optimum is hotter than what we typically plant these at, right? If you see, if you look at this uh, figure over here, a lot of the optimum temperatures are towards the 80s, even up to the 90s and above for many of our species, which is much hotter than we typically will germinate our seeds at. So um, what we can do is use bottom heat to, if we are growing indoors, right, we can use, or at a greenhouse, we can set up a system where we heat the um, seeds as we're growing them, and that will improve their germination. It's important to remove them from heat as soon as they germinate because we don't want our plants to dry out, but 
that bottom heat should speed up uh, the germination process, right? And it can prove germination percentage and uniformity as well. So to actually do this, I have a little video of where I have a heating mat, something similar to that, right? And that just sits in a flat and you can uh, germinate your seeds right on top of that, you know, put another flat on it or wherever you're growing them. In my case, we're just doing um, plastic bags and a paper towel. So you can buy those mats if you're just doing like a small, um, you know, like something small, small grow operation, then those heating mats are fine. They're, you know, not crazy overpriced. But if you are, you know, trying to supply a larger area or a greenhouse or something, it could get expensive. So people have come up with a number of DIY versions of uh, making their own heat mats. Two of them, uh, two kind of big examples are one using rope lights, or which are like outside decorative lights. I've even seen Christmas tree lights um, or Christmas lights that they've used, reused for it. And they just string them along. They have a, a base, some sort of base, either wood or styrofoam. And then they string the lights uh, between strips, again, of styrofoam or wood. And then you could put another thing on top of there, or you can set your flats right on top of those rope lights and they create some heat and will provide some bottom heat to your uh, plants. You could also use heat cables that they might use if you are putting in a heated floor. So you can, if you want to build your own uh, bottom heat with heat cables, and then you could have, you have a whole bunch, you can, you know, add some heat to your bathroom floor if you'd like. So kind of two DIY versions. I kind of, I tend to like always trying like DIY versions of stuff. Um, so something you guys can experiment with if you're interested in. I haven't tried the rope lights yet, but it's something I'm going to because I think it's neat. But as you'll see in the demonstration video, I just have like your regular heat mat here. That works fine. Okay, so a couple little uh, tips or things that will aid in germination for you guys to be aware of. What we're going to look at now are methods to break seed dormancy. And, and uh, I ended the last lecture by briefly talking about seed dormancy and the reason it exists, right? Its evolutionary advantages. And said that particularly our wild plants, a lot of our wild plants are dormant. And again, this is a condition in which our seeds will not germinate under these environmental conditions, right? When we have water and the correct temperature and oxygen that are normally favorable for germination. And I said that there are two main types of seed dormancy. Exogenous, which is imposed by factors outside of the embryo, and then endogenous, which is uh, associated with the embryo, right? So it's something with the embryo that is maintaining dormancy. If it's exogenous, it's something outside of the embryo. And we have two main ways of uh, helping to break this dormancy, right? We have scarification, um, I always pronounced it scarification, uh, but apparently in a lot of the things that I've been listening to, they say scarification, potato, potato, uh, whatever you say, I'll say scarification for the rest of this, but I may default and say scarification at some point. Um, that is done primarily to alleviate exogenous seed dormancy, where it's some factor outside of the embryo, whereas stratification is done to alleviate endogenous uh, seed dormancy. And we're going to look at these more in depth right now. And we'll start with exogenous dormancy. So again, this is something outside of the embryo that is preventing germination. And typically it is the seed coat, right? But it could also be the endosperm, that storage, or a remnant of the pericarp, the fruit tissue. And it maintains, these structures can maintain dormancy in a couple of different ways. One of the big ones that they can do is they can inhibit water intake. So if you have a very hard, solid seed coat that is um, impenetrable to water, it will prevent the seed from taking in water. And again, that first step of germination is that imbibition, taking in of water. So if your seed can't take in water, it's going to remain dormant and it's not going to germinate. Um, so that's a big way that the our, uh, seed coat can prevent germination of this exogenous dormancy. Uh, it can provide a mechanical restraint to the embryo expansion, right? So it could be so tough that the embryo can't even expand outside of it. 
it could limit oxygen to the embryo. So in cucumbers and spinach, they have this mucinolaginous, mucilaginous layers on the seed coats that can restrict gas exchange. And remember, gas is important. Oxygen is important for uh, germination. And then we can either have a uh, some sort of structure, whether it's a seed coat or a remnant of the pericarp, that is going to prevent the leaching of inhibitors. So there may be some hormone inhibitors that are preventing the seed from germinating, that this stuff prevents those from getting leached out. Or it could be the opposite way. There may be something um, in the pericarp or the seed coat itself that is contributing inhibitors to the seed, right? So all different mechanisms, but essentially the thing to remember is that it is the, primarily it's the seed coat or some remnant of the pericarp that is keeping this uh, embryo, this seed from germinating. And we can further break down this exogenous dormancy into two types, physical and chemical dormancy. Right? And physical dormancy is this hard seed coat that I mentioned, right? It's impermeable to water, uh, whereas chemical dormancy is related to the chemicals. Uh, and these chemicals may be in the fruit or in the seed coat that are gonna inhibit germination in one way or another. And so for an example of physical dormancy with that hard seed coat, we can look at plants in the Fabaceae uh, family, which are our peas and beans and our lupines. Um, they have this hard seed coat. And normally in nature, these seed coats are softened by microorganisms in the soil, or if these are eaten by organisms as they pass through an organism's digestive tract, it'll gradually break down these seed coats and then allow for germination. Uh, chemical dormancy, for example, it could be our citrus fruits, our cucurbits, pumpkin squash melons, stone fruits, apples, oaks. They could have, they have um, chemicals, whether it's these phenolic acids, tannins, abscisic acid, uh, that are inhibiting um, germination, right, in one way or another. And again, in nature, this would, these either the fruit or the seed coats gradually break down and these chemicals get leached out by rains or as that seed coat is broken down, much like how it gets broken down uh, if we're talking about a hard seed, co seed coat, like I mentioned in physical dormancy. So we have exogenous dormancy and it's the our seed coat primarily is the culprit. How then do we handle this from a um, propagation perspective? Well, we can do scarification. And really there's different types of scarification, but all of it involved just damaging the seed coat, right? And the easiest way is mechanical scarification. And that's the physical removal of part of the seed coat. And there are different techniques you can use. If you are doing this at home, use sandpaper, 100 to 200 grit sandpaper, just rub the seed. I'm gonna show you a video in a second. You can use a small knife. Uh, I've seen people use a Dremel, right? And they have a little cutting edge and they use a Dremel or a uh, metal file. Anything that will help abrade the seed coat uh, that then will now allow water to and gas to come into the seed. Okay, quick and easy scarification, scarification methods. Take some sandpaper, anywhere between 100 and 200 grit. Take your seed. Have your seed on the center. And you just want to rub enough so you could see the abrasion in the seed coat. You can see how that some of that seed coat gets rubbed off. And there you go. You have your scarified seed. And if you have a whole bunch, you can do a whole bunch like that. A lot of times, if you do have a whole bunch, it's easier to do a soaking method, right? Another thing that you can do, you can use a knife. And you're going to want to just kind of slice off just a bit of your seed, right? So you can position your knife along at an angle and just cut off just a little bit of the seed coat that you can kind of see there, right? You can also do that. So two quick methods that you can use if you need to scarify your seeds. We could also soak our seed. Um, you can do, depending on the species, you can just do a regular cool water soak. 
and you're going to soak your seeds for about 8 to 12 hours. If you had me in plant science last year, we did that with our pea seeds, right? We soaked half of them. The other treatment, we didn't soak them. And that soaking of the seeds starts to loosen up the seed coat, and that's going to improve your germination speed in particular. That's what we saw with our pea plants, that the ones that we soaked, they germinated much faster than the ones that we did not soak. Besides a cool water soak, you can also do a hot water scarification where you're going to uh, soak your seeds in hot water uh, between 170 degrees to 212 degrees Fahrenheit for a period of time to, again, break down that seed coat. And we have a, a, a little graph over here that shows the amount of time that your the seed was soaked in hot water, and you can see how the germination percentage shoots up once you get to a, a certain period, right? And then if you soak it too long, you can begin to damage your seed. And that's what we're seeing over here. Uh, so in practice, what you guys can do if you are going to try this is bring water to a boil. Um, after it's boiling, take it off the burner, let it sit for about 30 seconds, and then you can pour it on your seeds. And then it'll be hot initially, and you just let it soak for about 12 to 24 hours. And that water is going to cool down, so it's not going to be, by the time... It could damage that seeds. The water's cool enough where it's not going to damage them. You let them soak, and then that should be enough to um, affect the seed coat enough where now you can plant your seeds and they should germinate uh, easier. So the last method of scarification that we're going to look at is chemical. So uh, you can um, soak your seeds in an acid solution. Now, in a university setting, or maybe in a commercial setting, I'm not sure, you can use sulfuric acid. However, <laughs> it's very effective, uh, but sulfuric acid is also dangerous, right? It's very, very toxic, corrosive. So, uh, at home, if you want to try this method, um, phosphoric acid works as well, and that's found in soda, and so does citric acid, and that's found in your citrus fruits. So, uh, I think a cool experiment for you guys to do if you're interested is, you know, maybe soak your seeds in like a can of Coke and see how it works. And what actually could be fun is you could soak your seeds and compare sodas, right? Maybe Coke versus Pepsi or Coke versus Sprite. See if there's a difference. I don't know. think it could be neat to try out and I might do it myself. Uh, or you can buy a um, citric acid as like a, a powder and rehydrate it and soak your seeds in that as well. Something to try, uh, might be interesting, might be fun. So plants that benefit from scarification. So a lot of our crop plants, um, they don't require this, right? I talked about the Fabaceae, your legumes, your peas and your beans. They don't require this, but they will benefit from it, right? Same with your cucurbits, the cucumber, squash, pumpkins, you can plant them as seeds and they will germinate, but they may benefit from this scarification process. Now, there are some plants where it's really recommended and uh, often needed. If you are growing nasturtiums, which are these guys, or morning glories, or moonflowers, uh, I think it is more required. I, you don't necessarily have a great germination without it. And typically more of your... Uh, uh, wild native plants, uh, you're more likely to need to do this process. So if you're growing, uh, so black walnuts, uh, red buds, apples, hickories, maples, butterflyweed, joe pieweed, some plants uh, that we kind of associate more with wild type or native type, um, you will often have to scarify your seeds. And there are resources out there on the internet to look up if you're interested what type of plants. This is kind of just a, a quick reference for you guys. So that was exogenous dormancy, right? The seed coat primarily that is preventing, in most cases, water from accessing your seed. In order to alleviate that, you just got to damage the seed coat. And there are those different methods that we talked about. Now, there is also this endogenous dormancy, and that is factors within the embryo that are preventing germination. And this could be, again, we have two types, physiological or morphological. So this endogenous physiological dormancy is the most common form of dormancy that you're that we're going to see. And we don't actually know the underlying causes, the underlying physiological causes. 
It is, we do know that abscisic acid and gibberellins play a role, right? Those are those two hormones that um, kind of have this interplay back and forth, whether we're going to keep our seed dormant, which is if there's more abscisic acid, it's saying keep it dormant. If it's more gibberellins, it's saying go ahead and germinate. There's this interplay between them. We know they play a role. We don't know the actual, uh, the full mechanism, right? But what we do know is that this endogenous physiological dormancy is alleviated through this process called stratification. And then we refer to it as moist chilling stratification. So in this process, our seeds are stored in a moist aerated substrate at chilling temperatures for a certain period of time. Now, early propagators would layer their seeds in a box between uh, layers of moist sand or soil. And that's why I refer to it as stratification, right? They made these stratified layers. And for this, temperature is the single most important factor. So if you are doing this, you need to keep your seeds at around 33 degrees Fahrenheit to 45 degrees Fahrenheit, right? Chilling, almost freezing. And you need to keep your moisture, you need, they need to be moist. You need your moisture about 20%. It's better if it's a little bit more, closer to 30%. So how do you do this if you were going to do this? Well, you can build your stratification box, right? You can lay your seeds, set it outside in the winter, and just let those seeds naturally stratify. Or uh, what most people do nowadays uh, is just use your fridge. And you got two different methods that you can use. You can use a paper towel, right? You dampen your paper towel very similarly. If you watch the bottom heat lab already, it's the same kind of procedure. You wet your towel, fold it over, spread your seeds on the towel, fold them over again to kind of sandwich them in. You place it in a Ziploc bag, you know, make sure to mark it, right, the date. And then you leave a little gap to allow for oxygen and you put that bag in the fridge for an extended period of time. And we'll talk about how long you need to put it in in the next couple slides. And you can periodically check on them, right? So you can use paper towel, or uh, as opposed, you can use some sand. And here, again, using your Ziploc bag, you're gonna put about a half a cup of sand in your bag. You add a tablespoon of water to moisten it, and you don't want it soaking wet. And then you add your seeds, mix them up, partially close your bag, label it, throw it in the fridge for an extended period of time, right? Very easy to do this. So how long do you need to stratify them for? Well, it depends on the species. There are kind of three levels of this physiological dormancy. We have non-deep, which is common in seeds of most of our herbaceous plants. And for this, you either need to stratify them for a short period of time, like one to eight weeks, or you don't even need to stratify them. You can just store them normally and they will uh, after ripen is the term that we refer to. So you store them normally, and then after a short period of time, uh, they will be ready to germinate. And this is true for most of our cultivated cereals, our grasses, vegetables, flower crops, right? The majority of stuff that we are planting, you don't really need to do this stratification. But for certain species, you do. And those would be more so the ones that respond to, and that have intermediate or deep physiological dormancy. So if we have intermediate, you're gonna require about two to four months of cold stratification. And this is typical for our trees and shrubs that grow in the temperate region that you would find here, some more of our native trees and shrubs. Or you could have cases where you need even four, over four months of cold stratification. And that is more common if you are trying to grow cherries, plums, or peaches from seed. Uh, so there are some general rules. Uh, if we are trying to um, think about what plants may require stratification, right? If you don't know offhand, uh, typically your cold hardy, woody deciduous or, or evergreen perennials. So your temperate forest trees and shrubs. So in this area, your perennials that withstand, that can withstand the winter that we have here, they are often gonna require stratification and this could be long, two to four months, as we talked about, right? When we talked about our intermediate right here. And also your um, cold hardy herbaceous perennials, things like milkweed or lupines or perennial poppies, they are also going to uh, require stratification. Really plants that grow in an area that experience cold typically will require some form of stratification. 
And again, that is goes back to that idea of this is an evolutionary adaptation that these plants have that allows them when they are dropping their seeds for those seeds to wait to germinate until the following spring, right? They need that period of cold because that's signifying what's happening over the winter and they don't want to germinate before the winter. So they wait it out, they get that period of cold. And then once the temperatures heat up again, they can start germinating in the spring and have this nice growing season. So I also have a link that will link you to more seeds that will, if you're trying to grow them, that will need a cold stratification. Uh, so that'll uh, give you some more information there. And again, it's more of your um, kind of native species that you're trying to grow, right? Native wildflowers, um, trees and shrubs that you would find in this area. So we also have um, some seeds that require, that have photo dormancy. So they either require light to germinate or they will require darkness, right? And this is controlled by the phytochrome pigment system. We're not going to get into it. If you had plant science, you should remember the phytochrome pigment system, right? It plays an important role in our plants. But um, some examples of plants that require light are asters, begonias, impatiens, uh, kalanchoe. It's a a pretty neat, we'll talk about it later on, it's a pretty neat uh, succulent that we have growing in our greenhouse, or we did. Um, birches, lettuce seeds, they all require light to germinate, whereas uh, allium uh, are going to need uh, darkness, and those alliums are your uh, garlic, onions, etc. Right? So another thing to be aware of with certain species, photodormancy. And then there is this concept of morphological dormancy, where uh, by the time your seed is, sh is shed, um, the embryo is not fully developed, right? It's, it's uh, and not prepared, not ready for germination. So there just needs this natural period of time for your embryo to fully develop for then your seed to germinate. And this is true for a couple of different species, some carrots or carrots, ginseng, orchids, some palm species, they have this morphological dormancy where the embryo is just undeveloped and it needs time to develop. So that's just a natural time that you have to wait. So some palm species, it could be a long period of time. I have up there, some palms require three months of warm temperatures before you get signs of germination. And that is because that embryo is continuing to develop while the seed is already shed from the plant. And lastly, another, um, well, almost lastly, when we're talking about dormancy, um, there are examples of seeds that can have both physical and physiological dormancy, right? So it could have a hard seed coat and it could have some uh, physiological dormancy related to the embryo that is keeping it dormant. And they could be... Um, we have two different types that can vary based on the sequence, right? So we can have uh, a plant, the seed that has physiological dormancy and then physical dormancy, right? So you need this initial temperature to relieve that physiological dormancy. And then there you need actions to relieve the physical dormancy, right? So you have to cold stratify and then scarify, or it could be the other way around, which is more common. And that is where you have, um, some sort of physical dormancy, like a hard seed coat. And then you also have a physiological dormancy. So you need to stratify to alleviate that as well. And that is what you see with um, red buds, with button bush, with sumac. Uh, so I have, this is sumac and button bush right here. With those, they have both physical dormancy. So they have hard seed coat that you would need to scarify and they have physiological dormancy, so you'd also need to cold stratify them as well. And one more little thing, there's this idea of secondary dormancy where a plant, a plant can start germination or kick off that process, but then if conditions become unfavorable again, they can go back into dormancy. Just want you guys to be aware of it. So the last thing uh, that we're going to talk about in this lecture is growing for seed. Right, so <clears throat> say you guys are interested in breeding uh, plants or just interested in growing seed to sell seed or just to save seed, and you wanna get into that, there are some things you need to be aware of. 
So first you need to know what species you're growing, right? Is it an open pollinated species, right? So typically they are being pollinated in a field and is allowing for some genetic crosses. Is it a hybrid, right? We talked about hybrids and the problem with trying to save hybrid seed, right? That we know it doesn't breed true. The, the offspring of uh, hybrid seed will not have will not have the same genotype, it will not be hybrids. So you need to be aware of that. You need to be aware of its life cycle, right? Is it an annual? Is it a biennial or perennial? Right, if it's an annual, it's relatively easy. You know it's going to flower uh, within that one growing season. Biennials, if you're looking at carrots, you're gonna have to grow them for two years, right? That first year, they are not going to flower. You need to wait to that second year for them to flower. And same with perennials, you may, they may not flower every year, so you may have to wait, especially when you're beginning growing them, right? If we're talking, particularly if we're talking about trees or shrubs. And you need to be aware of whether they are cross-pollinated or self-pollinated, right? So are they, um, do they, uh, is there a lot of cross-pollination that occurs, right? Do we need to plant more plants to ensure that we have that cross-pollination? Are they more self-pollinated? And that's also going to play a role in how we need to isolate these, right? Again, if going back to those breeding and those genetics lectures, if we are growing whatever we're growing and we know that there is, that this plant is cross-pollinated, then we need to be aware of what our neighbors are growing uh, depending on, you know, how big our property is, right? Because you can have cross-pollination up to a couple miles. So, if we want to ensure that we are growing this one heirloom variety and just this heirloom variety, uh, the, um, we're growing them and the seed, the offspring are going to have the same traits as this heirloom that we're, we're growing. We need to be aware of what we're growing around it and isolate it appropriately. Uh, so there is a handy seed saving chart that I have listed there. Uh, the Seed Savers Exchange actually has a lot of good information on if you're trying to grow for seed. But that chart there will give you information on a number of different species, um, whether they are cross-pollinated or self-pollinated, where, how much you would need to isolate them, how many you need to grow to ensure there is proper genetic diversity within uh, your species, et cetera. So it's a really good reference if you guys are interested in growing for seed. So that's kind of one big thing you need to know what to grow. Another important uh, thing to be aware of is that growing for seed is different than growing for fruit, right? So certain fruits mature or are market ready or ready for eating long before the seeds are mature. And this is true for cucumbers, eggplant, peas, beans, carrot, cabbage, carrots, right? So you need to wait, right? So in the case of beans, you're not going to pick until uh, that they have dried up, right? That fruit is dry or it's overripe or slightly mushy in the case of tomatoes or peppers, right? So you're gonna, you have to wait. You're not really gonna get your fruits for these species that you want uh, at that time. You have to wait a longer time to harvest. And you also need to know whether it's uh, what they refer to as a wet or a dry fruit, like for a wet fruit where um, we have a fleshy uh, pericarp, a fleshy fruit, um, you may need to separate the gel around the seed from the seed. Uh, for example, uh, with tomatoes, you're going to try and separate those seeds out. They'll have like a gel, you know, around them. You could put them in water, a jar of water, stir it twice a day. Eventually those seeds will sink to the bottom and then you could take them and dry them out. All right. So some other things to be aware of. And then lastly, how are you going to store your seed? Well, you want to, if you're storing your seed, um, you want to keep them dry and cool, right? Again, they like temperatures similar to if we are stratifying our seeds, so you can just keep them in the fridge, right? Or you can keep them if you have a, a cellar, uh, you can keep them there, a cool cellar. We want to keep them dry as opposed to if we are stratifying and we we're keeping them moist. So you can get those little silica gel packets, right? You can store your seeds in a glass jar, have them in packets, drop in a silica gel packet to absorb moisture. If you don't have those, um, you could also use a little workaround. You can have, you can buy powdered milk, put one or two teaspoons of powdered milk in a tissue or cheesecloth, cheesecloth and throw that in with there and that's gonna help absorb moisture. So you keep your seeds dry and cool um, and they could last, depending on the species, they could last for uh, you know a couple of years. So those are tips for growing seed. So that is it for this lecture. 
Um, and this was just uh, to introduce you some ways of how we measure germination uh, and then provide some tips and some practical things of how we can improve germination for certain species. Uh, so I hope you guys are doing well and I will see you next time.